Good morning, ACF Church. We're so excited that you joined us online uh, this morning for our service. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, we would love to invite you to join us on our church online platform. Uh, you can find the link for that in the description. Uh, church online is just a great way for us to get connected uh, with you. Uh, Michelle is our online host this morning, and so she would love to, to get to meet you, to interact with you uh, during the service. And so we would love to invite you to join us over there. Uh, well, hey, my name is Cody Harmon. I'm one of the pastors here at ACF, and I'm so excited that you're here with us. We've got a great service plan uh, for this morning, so I'm glad that you chose to spend your time with us. And uh, if you're on our church online platform right now, uh, we'd love for you just to put in the chat uh, where you're watching us from. Uh, we know many of you are watching from across Alaska or maybe in a different state or maybe in a, even in a different part of the world. And so we would love to, to just hear uh, where you're watching from and just get to, to talk to you and interact with you um, there for that. And, uh, and and this morning, too, we've got some, some exciting new things coming up for our online um, service where uh, one thing that we love to do here at ACF is celebrate baptism and people taking a next step in following Jesus. And that's something that we now want to offer to our online um, crowd as well, that, that you guys are a part of the ACF family, and we would love to be able to celebrate that with you. And so if you've never been baptized before, or if that's something that you've wanted to do, but haven't been able to, or, or haven't taken that step yet, we would love to help you take that step. And so all, all that you even really need for that is just a body of water, uh, some kind of Wi-Fi connection or cell phone service, and uh, someone that you know who's a follower of Jesus to baptize you. And we would love to be able to, to stream that into our service, to be able to celebrate that with you here in person in Eagle River as you're getting baptized, wherever that might be. So if that's a step that you want to take, if that's something that you're interested in and just want uh, to or just have some questions about and want some more information on, uh, Michelle would love to answer any questions that you have. Just feel free to put any of that in the chat as well. And uh, we would love to get you some more information on baptism. And this morning, at any point in the service, if you've got a prayer request or if you just want to share something that God is laying on your heart or is doing during worship and, and during the, the message this morning, uh, feel free to put that in the chat as well. We would love to hear from you this morning because we have a great service. Pastor Brian's going to be talking about uh, praying through pain and through grief. And that's one of those things that, that we've all have come up against at some point in our lives, but can be difficult to navigate our way through. And so if you would, let's just stand up together and worship this morning as we head into that and see what God has to say to us for that this morning.
how the story ends We will be with you again You're my Savior You're my Savior My defense No more fear in life or death Church. My name is Cody Harmon. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are so excited uh, that you're spending your Sunday um, here with us. Uh, and, and this morning, one thing that we get to do every week in every service that we do is just pray together as a church. And so this morning, if there's uh, at any point you feel like you need prayer for something or just need someone to come alongside you in anything, we've got a prayer room in the back of the room to my left uh, over there with some amazing surf team members that would love to pray over you and, and, and help you with anything that you've got going on. Uh, but this morning, as a, as a church uh, together, we get to pray over some of our most recent Crash Course graduates. Uh, if you haven't been through Crash Course or you don't know what that is, Crash Course is awesome. It's just a great way where you can get to know ACF and our values and our vision. Uh, myself and, and my wife, when we moved up here this summer, that was like the first thing that we did was try to get into the next uh, crash course to be able to, to hear what it is that God has already done at ACF and then what God is going to do, what we're praying for God to do um, here at our church. And so behind me on the screen there, there's a, a picture of some of our most recent graduates that went through our most recent uh, crash course class. And so uh, they, they just signed up. They said, hey, I want to hear more about about, uh, the church. I want to hear more about how I can get involved and, and how they are gifted in that. And, and so if you haven't been through that yet, we've got another one coming up on November 19th. And again, that's just a great way to, to learn more about how you're gifted and, and how we can partner with you uh, in seeing uh, God move in our community and move here at ACF. And so this morning, we're just going to pray over these graduates that God would use them and God would continue uh, to bless them in that. So if you would, if you would just extend a hand uh, towards the screen as we pray, this is a show of support and praying um, over them this morning. And so let's pray together. Um, God, thank you uh, for this group of people. God, thank you just for their um, yes to say, God, I just want to go where you're calling me to go and, and do what you're asking me to do. And so God, I just pray for everyone on the screen, God, that you would just continue to use them in this community. God, that you would continue to use them to, to work 
work uh, here at ACF and, and in Eagle River and, and, and everything that you have for them. So God, I pray just for a continued blessing for them, God, that you would continue to work through them, that you would continue to use their gifts, God, to, to serve this community and the people around us, God, so that it can be in Alaska as it is in heaven. So God, thank you for them. Thank you for what you were doing here in our midst. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, welcome to church today. Let's celebrate being in the house of God together today. So glad that you're here. Online family, we love you. We're so grateful for you as well. And if you're new to ACF, my name is Brian. And uh, ACF Church exists to amplify the grace of Jesus to the church, the unchurched, and the de church. So it's just our heart that you would find a place to ask questions, to work through your doubts, and hopefully enter into a relationship with Jesus. And so we're so glad that you're here. We're actually in a season as a church. And we're calling this season The Deeper Life. And we're actually spending the next year talking through what does it mean to experience the deeper life. And the reason we're doing this is because as we've talked to people, not just in the church, but friends and neighbors in our community, what we're hearing from people is that there's this desire for something more. That when people are considering their lives, there's this feeling like, I'm not experiencing what I was meant to experience. I'm not living the life I was built for. And so we believe that there's a deeper life that God is inviting every single person into that, man, if you came today and you didn't even know what, what to expect today, I want you to hear this. God wants a deeper life for you. And we actually believe that Jesus is the deeper life we all long for, that it's in looking in the eyes of Jesus that we begin to discover who we actually are. And that's such a good thing to do. So today we're talking about prayer. This is the series that we've been in uh, in this season is uh, this idea of being a, 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 in a deeper life through prayer, that prayer is a way that we access the deeper life. So a few years ago, I was sitting at the breakfast table with my wife, and she goes, hey, honey, today is the day we got to take Cadence to get her shot. So Cadence was much littler at this point, and uh, it was like her first time to go get her shots. And I'm already kind of filled with a little anxiety because, you know, as a parent, you don't, you don't want your kid to feel pain, right? You don't want them to feel pain, but you know that that's kind of part of the game. And so she hadn't had any shots before, so we load her up into the car, and she, she's completely oblivious, right? It's like a lamb to slaughter. She has no idea what's coming for her. We, we get to the doctor's office, and we go inside, and she's got like a little sucker, and she's kind of laughing, and she's happening, and I'm just like, oh my goodness. Oh, she has no idea. And so we sit her down, and the nurse comes in with a little rolly table, you know, with all the implements of destruction on it, but it's covered up, it's covered up with a little cloth, so you don't have to look at it. And so she has no idea, and and uh, Cadence is just sitting there, and the nurse comes over to me, and she goes, hey, I need you to hold on to her. And I was like, you hold on to her. I don't want to hold on to her. Like, you do it. And she's like, no, 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 you're her dad. You need, to, you need to hold on to her. And so the way she set this whole thing up is I sat in a chair, and my daughter sat right on my lap looking me straight in the eyes. <laughs> and we're just looking at each other, and I'm like, hey, sweetheart. She's like, hey, daddy, you know, and and, and while we're kind of just chatting, the nurse, you know, gets the alcohol swab and like puts it on the leg and she's just kind of looking at me and then all of a sudden she pulls out, you know, the needle and, it, and it's like a knife into my daughter's leg and I'm, I, I watch this whole thing go down through the eyes of my daughter and she goes from this sense of complete joy and safety to total betrayal in just a second, just this look in her eyes like... What have you done? So she starts squirming and, and, and she can't move. So I, I wrap my arms around her and I'm holding her tight. And, and, and then like there's, there's like three more shots coming. And so she's like, it'll be quick, it'll be quick. And the lady gets all the shots in her leg. And my daughter's just losing her mind, crying. And, and just, you can see it in her face. She's like, if you loved me, why wouldn't you stop this? If you're my father, why would you allow me to experience this? And I wanted to start with that story because today... We're going to talk about what it looks like to pray through suffering. How do we become people who pray when life really hurts? And if you have a Bible, I want you to open up to the book of Job. We're going to do kind of a quick overview of this story, and there's just so much here. I'd encourage you to read 
the whole book of Job later, but uh, we're, we're just going to use this kind of as an example of suffering and, and really how to pray and lean into a relationship with God when life really hurts because we've all been there before. So this is Job chapter 1. We're going to start off in verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then. Everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And there's one more passage. This is a quote from Job. He says this, In the face of suffering, Job 13, 15, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. So can we agree that life never seems to run out of new ways to suffer? Can we agree that as soon as you felt like you have found the lowest depths of the pit of suffering, there seems to be like another new way to suffer? And from the beginning of our lives, we're made aware of the pain of this existence. At a young age, we get like a bump on the head or a skin knee, and this is the kind of suffering and pain that comes and then it goes. But then suffering sort of graduates, doesn't it? into deeper things, into an unfulfilled need for affirmation or the realization that all of your friends seem to have two parents and you only have one, and you wonder, why is that? Then it intensifies into rejection from friends or, or maybe that girl of your dreams who dumped you and made it worse just by saying, you know, uh, we're just not made for each other or you're just not my type, right? And, and, and so then there's suffering in relationships. And then maybe it moves on to the loss of that childhood friend. It just didn't make sense because everybody said they were in the best shape of their life. And then that understanding of suffering begins to grow into a global scale. And we, we start to see natural disasters and hurricanes and wildfires in Hawaii and wars in Ukraine and, and in Israel and Maybe you found yourself kind of flinching as you turn on the news lately or open your email. For me, because I know that my reaction is probably going to be best summed up by author Dorothy Parker, as she famously put it, what fresh hell is this? You ever felt like that? Like when you wake up in the morning, you're just like, what is the fresh version of hell on earth that I'm going to experience today? Because we see hell everywhere in our daily existence. Things, can we agree, are not as they were meant to be. Things are not as they were meant to be, and, and if we are honest, life just hurts sometimes. And now, you might be a church person and have been a Christian your whole life, and so you've, you know all the Bible verses, right? You know all things work together for the good of those who are called according to God's purpose, which, may I suggest, is not the first verse to throw out when somebody is suffering that you know. Maybe you just need to be with them in the struggle. And there's even a brand of Christianity that thinks acknowledging pain and suffering in the world somehow denies God's authority over it, but I would highly disagree. In fact, I think we need to acknowledge pain and suffering to truly understand the truth of the gospel. Because pain and suffering reminds us of why Jesus actually had to come. And so we have to acknowledge this world is not as it should be. Sometimes life just hurts, and when life really hurts, the question that we need to ask is this, is God good? Now, I want you to reflect on that question here for a moment. This is something we say all the time. God is good, right? What's the response? All the time, right? All the time, God is, okay, that's great. We can hype each other up with that. But do you really believe that God is good? I want you to just work through the initial, if you're a believer, to, to say, oh, yeah, I, absolutely, Brian, I believe God is good. I want you to work past that and ask the question, is there a deeper revelation of God's goodness that God might have for me today? And could I believe this in a deeper and more profound way? And then maybe there's someone in the room today and your, your answer is easy to that question. No, he's not. Because I know what I've been through. And I know how I've suffered. And if God was good, he'd never let me experience that. You have looked into the eyes of your father while you experienced pain and thought, if you loved me, you would never allow this. If you, and, and so maybe that's you today and you really do question 
if God was really good. You see, this question shows us kind of like the source of all sin because the source of all sin is the questioning of God's goodness. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, we see three lies that were used against Adam and Eve to tempt them into sin. And the first lie is this, you can't trust God. The second lie is this, God is not loving. And the third lie is this, He does not have your best interest in mind. And all of these are are lies that question the goodness of God. Now, when it comes to questioning God's goodness, or really anybody's goodness for that matter, communication is key, right? We've got to communicate about those things, right? And we know that prayer is communion and conversation with God. It's how we communicate with God. But if you question God's goodness, you will not communicate with God. In fact, I would guess there's some people in the room who you stopped praying a long time ago, and the reason you stopped praying was because you questioned whether God was good. You thought once again, man, if you were good, you wouldn't allow that to happen. And we know this, that a lack of communication is the death of any relationship. I know this in my marriage. So my wife and I, about five years ago, we're going through the hardest season of our marriage, and we're getting some marriage counseling, and we sit down with uh, this therapist, and she goes, hey, you guys, listen, you need to start to communicate. And I was like, hey, uh, actually, communication's the problem. When we communicate, it just goes completely wrong. Can we just learn to not communicate? Maybe that's what we need. And she goes, no, 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 you don't understand. You guys are making a lot of noise, but you're not communicating. And I believe there's a lot of people that you're making a lot of noise. You're saying a lot of stuff, but you're not really communicating with God. So what happens is we distance ourselves from God when we suffer. And suffering can lead people away from God. But here's what I want to propose today, that suffering actually leads us closer to the heart of God when we pray. Your your suffering, no matter what it is, can lead you closer to the heart of God when you're willing to communicate and converse with your Father. It's an opportunity to hear God in some deeper ways. In fact, C.S. Lewis says this. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. Some of you have experienced this where you never heard God more clearly than when you were suffering. You never had a deeper, more intimate connection with God than when you were experiencing pain. You never had a prayer life that was so real as you did when you were going through something very, very difficult. Jesus says this in Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. In other words, when you suffer, it's an opportunity to be near to the heart of God, and you will, be, you will be connected and comforted by God when you grieve and when you mourn. So I want you to just consider, where has life been painful for you? Maybe it's not right now. Maybe you're like, life's pretty good. But it was years ago, it was something that you went through. I was taking a friend out for coffee recently, and we were just kind of getting to know each other. And I was asking kind of some of those basic questions. What brought you up to Alaska? And, you know, what, what, what's your family been like? And... Where'd you grow up and where have you lived? And I asked this question. I asked, hey, tell me about your dad. And the conversation was completely normal up to this point. But when I said, tell me about your dad, I I felt a shift. And immediately I watched just a tear come down his face. And he said, oh, that's that's a long story. I'm not sure I've got time for that. And maybe you've been there where you, you're just having a conversation with somebody and somehow you realize that you've wandered into sacred territory in their lives. And there's emotion and there's feelings and there's something there, there's a deeper wound that, that, that's there that needs to be talked about but maybe hasn't been. And so you know when the emotions begin to swell and the feelings and the reactions begin to happen that there's probably something there yet to be processed. And I say this all the time that sometimes we need to go backwards to go forward. In order for you to move forward in life, sometimes you need to go back to those most painful moments in your life and ask yourself the question, where was God in that moment? And what you'll begin to realize, I think, is this, that God was there. And he grieves when we grieve. And and when there's evil that's done to us, it breaks the heart of God. God was there in that moment. And, And maybe for you today, you need to go back to that place of pain so that you can go forward with God. And maybe that was the moment you said, I'm not gonna pray anymore. I'm no longer going to reach out to this God. Richard Rohr says this, if we do not transform our pain, we will most assuredly transmit it. And if we look at the world around us, what I look at and what I see is a lot of people who have been wounded and who are giving away their wounds. I want to promise you this, if you don't let the gospel 
impact your wounds and the goodness of Jesus begin to heal your wounds, you will definitely give them away to your friends. You will definitely give them away to your kids. You will give them away to your spouse because that's what happens is, as, it's, as it's been said before, hurt people hurt people, right? People who've been wounded wound other people. So when we're wounded and when they're suffering, we question God's goodness. And the reason is because we talked last week, we go, man, if this is your will, again, back to the story, you're looking God in the eye and you thought you could trust him, but then you started feeling pain and you thought, if this is your will, then you're not good. But as we talked last week, when Jesus teaches the disciples to pray, he teaches them to pray that it would be, his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the reason he teaches them that, to pray that is because God's will is not currently being done on earth as it is in heaven. It will be, and that's why we pray it. So when you pray for God's will to be done off on earth as it is in heaven, you're praying for a promise. You're praying for something that's coming one day. God's will will be done. His reign will be here on earth as it is in heaven. He will return and establish his kingdom and rule here, and there will be no more suffering. And we look forward to that day, but we are not living in that moment currently. And you need to understand that because what can happen is we can start to believe that the origin of evil and sin is God. And that's just a lie. What we see clearly through the Gospels is the origin of sin is not God. It is evil that exists in the world. So I want to make a statement. And this is going to sound like a very simple statement. But it's the most profound reality that you will ever believe as a Christian. And it's this. God is good. He really is. God is good. And, and until you believe this, you will never be a person of prayer. And if you're here and you're like, I believe it, move on, Brian. No, no. Let, let, let's, let's talk about your life a little bit because is there sin in your life? Answer, answer in the room. Yes, right? There, and sin is just a rejection of what God says is good. That's all sin is. Sin is when we reject what God says is good. And so you're like, no, I believe that God is good. All right. Are you submitting to what God says is good in your sexual life? Whoops. Are you submitting, submitting to what God says is good in your finances? Whoops. Are you submitting to what God says in the way you spend your time, in the way you speak to other people? Like, do you live like Jesus? Because when you don't live like Jesus, what you're saying is that God isn't good. It's, here's a kind of example. So I'm teaching a, uh, a young lady, my daughter, how to drive right now. And, so pray for me. And it's been, a, it's been a great journey. She's a good little driver. But when you're teaching a teenager to drive, you're, you're giving them tips along the way. And um, this is kind of something that we deal with a lot of times with, with our, our kids is, is uh, mom and dad don't know as much as they think they know. It's, it's kind of the thought. It's like, man, they, I don't know why you're saying this. And so we'll be driving down the highway. And the recent lesson that I've been teaching her is about the blind spot. And I'm like, yes, check your mirrors, but you have to check your blind spot. And we get into these arguments, and I know what's in her mind. She's like, I think you just made up this thing called the blind spot. Like, I don't think it actually exists because I have mirrors, Dad. See, mirror, mirror, there's no car. And until you start changing lanes when there's a, an 18-wheeler in your blind spot, you don't believe that there's a blind spot. But then when you, when, you, when you experience it and you see it, you go, oh, I get it now. I get it. Like, my father's just trying to protect me. He's just trying to watch out for me, but until you experience it and see the other end of it, you, you just start to question the goodness of the person that's teaching you things. And I've said this before, when God says don't, what he means is don't hurt yourself. It, whenever God says don't do something, he's saying, I don't want you to hurt yourself. He's watching out for you. He's caring for you. Do you actually believe in the goodness of God? Have you submitted every part of your life to God? Because when we don't submit to what God says is best, what we question is whether or not he's good. Does that make sense? And so I want you to just think, like, maybe, maybe back the truck up if you're like, oh, I know that God's good. Maybe there's aspects of your life where you don't believe in his goodness. But he is good. And 1 John 1.5 says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. You need to understand that. God is not the source of evil, but he always uses evil for good. God is not the source of evil. He is always using evil and leveraging evil, but he is not the source of evil because God is light and in him is no darkness at all, which to me begs the question, then how did this world get so screwed up? Why is the world so messed up right now? You see, I think we need to remember this, that when sin entered the world, suffering came in right behind it. 
That's why the world's so messed up. When sin entered the world, suffering came in right behind it. And this is the result of something that we know as free will. And here's kind of the process. Here's how it works. I, we'll put these slides up on the screen. And the first thing you need to understand is that God is love. He is love in his essence. God doesn't just love, he is love. I am not love. Let me be the first to say that. Ask my wife. I am not love. I try to love. I do love sometimes, but in my essence, as a, as a, as a sinful person, apart from the presence of God in my life, I am not love, but God is love. Next thing is this. His love resulted in creation. Remember when I was dating my wife, we talked about having kids someday. Then we got married, and then after a, a couple years, we had a child. Th- this child was a result of our love. You see, love always creates. It's what it does. Love wants to expand. It wants to grow. It wants to give itself away. What we know about God is that he is fully complete within himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God doesn't need you. Amen to that, right? God doesn't need me. But he chose to create as a result of his perfect love within himself. So his love resulted in creation. It resulted in you and me. And his desire is a relationship. When you have kids, you want to know them. You want, to know, you want a relationship with them. But here's the thing about relationships. Relationships demand free will. If there's no free will, there is no relationship, okay? So if, like, I tell my kids, hey, love me or I'm going to drive you out into the Kinnick River somewhere and bury you in a ditch. You're like, is that love? That is not love, right? That's what gets you put in prison. You don't do that. That's not, an, that's not a relationship. They're like, I love you? <laughs> don't kill me, right? That's not love. Relationships demand free will, and free will led to sin. You better believe your kids are going to reject what you say to them sometimes. They're just not going to get it sometimes. In the same way, we have rejected what God says is best for us. We just don't get it sometimes. And free will led to sin, and sin ultimately creates suffering. Sin creates suffering. This is why God is so angry about sin. That's why you see this, this God. Sometimes people think God is you know, bipolar, Old Testament God, New Testament God. He's the same God. He's always been a God of grace. But when you see God enraged over sin, it's because he hates that sin creates suffering in the lives of his people. Just like any loving parent hates the things that destroy the lives of their children, God hates the things that destroy our lives, and those things are called sin. So, then why did God make us in the first place? You ever been in a place of such dark suffering that you just thought, why am I even here? Why why was I even created in the first place? And once again, the illustration of being a parent works perfectly. For Amanda and myself, when we talked about having kids, we made a decision to bring a child into this world, and what we knew when we made that decision is that 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 child would suffer. It's a guarantee. If you're going to have a child, that child will suffer. But we still made the, church, made the decision to have a child, didn't we? Why? Because love creates. It's what, it's what it does. And the same is true that God created us knowing that we would suffer, but also knowing that he would provide a way to sustain us through the sufficient love of Jesus. He is enough when you suffer. And in fact, there's some of you in the room who I know some of your stories. You have suffered deeply. You know the love of God in ways that I haven't understood it yet. You've experienced the presence of God in some ways that I have not yet experienced it because of your suffering that you've gone through. Back to the book of Job. The book of Job is a story told kind of in the form of a poem, if you read through it. And it begins with an introduction describing Job as a good man. He's got this good relationship with God. He's faithful to God. He's, He's wealthy. He's blessed. And he's concerned with a right relationship between God and his family as well. He's a good man. And then there's this meeting between God and Satan, and God permits Satan to test Job's loyalty. And these tests result in a destruction of Job's family, in his possessions, in his wealth. And then he's reduced to sitting in agony in an ash heap. And then these three friends come to him. And if you know the story, these three friends, they're not that helpful. Like when you're grieving, these are not the friends that you really want to call because these friends enter into three rounds of lengthy arguments where they make the case that Job's suffering is a result of his sin. And so they want to accuse him of that reality, and a lot of people still struggle with this today. Many people believe that maybe who are here, that when you suffer, it's because you did something 
wrong. I, I call it Christian karma. That's what I call it, right? Like you do good, God gives you good. You do bad, God gives you bad. That's the opposite of grace, right? It's that just whatever you do is what you get. No, praise God that the gospel is not that. The gospel is a gospel of grace, that what Jesus did, we get. What Jesus accomplished, we get. That's the story of grace. In fact, in John chapter 9, Jesus deals with this struggle where uh, there's this man who is suffering and Jesus basically says, hey, he's not suffering because of his sin. He's suffering because this is an opportunity to show God to the people around him. So Job, he suffers. He's in this terrible place. He's got these friends who are not any help. And then he ent enters into this time where he starts to take God to court, essentially. He says, God, you need to defend yourself. And he just, he puts God in a, in a courtroom situation. And maybe this is you where you're, you're in the suffering season of life and, you know, God is sort of on the, on the defense stand and you're just questioning him and you're calling out to him, why would you do this? Which I, I just want to tell you that, right, tell you this right now, that if this is you, if you're, if you're just kind of accusing God right now and you're just, man, struggling with what he's doing, you're in a better place than the person who isn't talking to God at all. Once again, I tell married couples this all the time. If you're arguing, you're in a better place than if you just are stonewalling one another and not talking. I mean, the worst thing for a relationship, you are nearing the end when you're just not talking anymore. And so at least you're, at least you're sharing your heart. And so what we see is Job, he just kind of cries out to God all of these accusations, all of these questions, and it's not pretty. It's kind of messy. But then God responds to Job and speaks to him from out of this storm, and he confronts Job with this vast, expansive list of unanswerable questions and aspects of who he is and his creation and nature. And then ultimately Job confesses his ignorance. He's like, oh man, I, I didn't get it, God. I didn't really understand it, but now I get it. I get who you are. And at the end, Job and his friends, they're reconciled to each other, to God. And, and Job is restored to even more than his former glory. You say, well, that's a good story, Brian. What's it have to do with my life? Well, there's a few things we see in the way Job responds to suffering that I think we can learn from. You know, what do you do when life hurts? The first thing is this, cursing God won't make it better. This, is, this can be a reaction to curse God when we're suffering. In fact, in Job 2, verse 9, his wife gives him some advice. It says, his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. So men, listen to your wives, unless she says curse God. Then don't listen to her at all. This is bad advice. But now I want to give this lady some grace because she's lost her children. She's lost her home. Her husband is like nearing death. He's just in, in pain and suffering. I mean, everything about her life is, is a, a disaster. And she's like, are you still maintaining your integrity? Are you still worshiping this God? Some of you have been there. Where you've gone through hard things and the people around you are like, how could you even love a God like that? That's basically what she's saying. So she says, curse God and die. And basically, in, 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 in her mindset, what she's saying is when you curse God, he will kill you. So go ahead and curse God so that he will kill you so that all of this can be done. Now, what does it mean to actually curse God? It's not just to say a swear word. To say like, oh my God is not cursing God. To curse God is to attribute evil to God. It's to look at evil and say, this is God doing this evil. He is it. What we know in the story of Job is that it was not God. It was the work of the devil, right? That was, that was actually doing this evil. And so, we, But we'll see this today where people will attribute evil to the heart of God. And that's what it means to literally curse God. In fact, I was watching the news this last week. And I'm seeing people overseas doing these horrible, evil, atrocious things to other human beings as they scream, that God is great in their own language. That's attributing that, that, that God is doing these things, that God is the source of this evil, and that's literally what it means to curse God. Have you cursed God in your suffering? Now, cursing is different than confronting. I want you to understand this. You can confront God without cursing God. And this is what we see in the life of Job. This is why Job still continues to maintain his integrity because even in confronting God and, saying, and, and you saying, I don't know why you did this. I feel like this was a bad decision. God, where were you? That's to confront but not to curse and say that God is the source of all of these things. Have you used your suffering as an excuse 
to curse or to reject God? Have you just kind of stopped believing that he was good? Maybe you just gave in to sin in your life and just said, man, I'm just going to do what I want if you're that kind of God. Maybe you just stopped going to church and you stopped praying and you stopped talking about spiritual things because of your suffering. Cursing God won't make it better. The next is this, ignoring God won't make it better. Some people curse God, other people completely ignore him. What we see in the life of Job is Job doesn't ignore God, he lays into God. And it's brutal and it's honest. And as he does, then God responds to Job. In Job 38, starting in verse 3, God says this, Brace yourself like a man. Which, by the way, if God ever says that to you, you better get ready, right? Like, stand up like a man. Get ready, because it's coming. He says, Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer for me. The tables are turned, Job. Get ready. He says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. And God goes on to explain who he is. The attributes of his his glory compared to this human being. God's like, hey, I know you don't get it, but I'm still God. I know you're suffering, but I'm still God. And there's a theme throughout the scriptures that we see over and over again, that God is always going to use evil for good. And so God shows Job, hey, this... This isn't what you think it is. And Job's openness and honesty confronting God made room for God then to reframe who he is to Job. To just say, Job, let me just kind of readjust your perspective. Let me give you a perspective adjustment. And this is why prayer is so important when we're suffering is because ignoring God won't make it better. But when you talk to him and when you're really honest with him, it'll make space for God to deal with your heart. And I'll just tell you this. I think most of us are about 98% honest with God. I think most of us are 98% honest with the people in our lives. But it's always the 2% that keeps us sick. Uh, like like in, in, in a relationship that you might have right now, there's something probably between you that you haven't, you haven't just said it. You haven't dealt with it. You've said 98%, but it's the 2% that keeps you sick. In fact, this last week, a friend came up to me and said, hey, I've got some things in my heart. And, uh, you know, I feel stupid even bringing it up, and it's just hard to bring it up, but, but just this is getting in the way of our relationship. And, and they just laid out a couple of things from a long time ago that were wounds and said, I don't want this to get in the way, but this, essentially this is my 2%. And I just said, thank you so much. Let's deal with that. Let's talk about that thing, and let's get it out of the way so that we can be in a healthy relationship. And I would get the, guess that most people in the room, we, we do that in our in our relationship with each other, and our relationships with God. Susan Scott, in her book, Fierce Conversations, which is a great book, I'd encourage you to read it, she says, a careful conversation is a failed conversation because it merely postpones the conversation that wants and needs to take place. It's time for you to stop being careful and to start being real with God. Start being honest about that 2% with God so that he can heal it. Next thing that we see in the life of Job is that being proud won't make it better. Sometimes it's our pride that's keeping us from getting better. And in Job's life, man, he, he was humbled by God. In Job 42, verse 5, he says, My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. I love that statement. Some of you are like, yeah, I've heard of God, but now I've seen him. And that's what happens in moments of suffering is, is this, this faith that's just like, I heard the gospel, I knew the scriptures, I knew the words, but now I see it played out before me, and God is so good. He says, therefore, I despise myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. This is a moment where Job's like, I feel bad about what I said to you, God, and uh, because I was so wrong about you. Let me just tell you something, that there's an aspect of who God is that you've got wrong right now. For me, too. We have this infinite God, and, 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 and you think you can know God for 10, 15, 20 years and figure him out? Let me just assure you, there's something about the, the, the character of God that you've got twisted in your mind right now. And God wants to make that right. He wants to clarify that in your life. And, and for him to do that, it takes humility. But if you're too proud, you're never going to get better. A friend of mine says this all the time, fake you is doing just fine. Fake you is just going through life, just acting like nothing's wrong. But if you want to get healed, it's time to get honest. It's time to be real about your struggle. What I see in the world is that there's a lot of wounded people. A lot of wounded people sharing their wounds 
with each other. And when you get wounded, you have an opportunity to move one of two directions. Would you put this graphic on the screen for me? We've got this iceberg, and this kind of describes your life. And you have an invitation when you get wounded, you experience pain, to move either down and into the deeper life or up into what's called the managed life. And what I see in the world around us is that most people live in the managed life, sort of managing their suffering, managing their pain, not actually getting healed, but just finding ways to hide it. This is the life of image management where you're just always thinking about how people see you. That's why you don't say the 2% because you're just kind of worried about changing what people will think. This is, a, this is a life that keeps us from the deeper life. And so in the managed life, what you experience is the false self. This is the, the fake you, right? This is the you that you, you're not proud of this, but let's be honest, sometimes there's a fake version of us that we put out there to the people around us. The managed life leads to coping and coping mechanisms. And I just, I promise you, everybody in the room, when you're suffering, you have a coping mechanism. You all have one. And for some person, it's maybe drinking themselves to sleep every night. For you, it's Amazon Prime. Got in your business in church today, right? Because here's what I know is that when you're, when you're feeling bad about yourself or about your life, maybe that's what you run to. But everybody kind of runs to something in the managed life. So they're never healing their wounds. They're just coping with their wounds. And this leads to superficial relationships, right? Where you've got all these people, that, these acquaintances, but you don't ever feel really known and loved. Because here's what we know. We know to feel loved, you have to be fully known. And that, that's the deepest desire of every human being is to be fully known and fully loved, which is what God offers us through Jesus. So this is the managed life. What motivates the managed life? Religious duty, like just doing the right thing, trying to put on the Christian face, trying to smile when you're at church. You know, God is good all the time, brother. Is it? Is it all the time that he's good? Like, do you really believe that? I want you to think about if you're living the managed life, the other option is to move into the deeper life. How do you access the deeper life? Well, when you're wounded, first you have to begin with prayer. Communion and conversation with God. It needs to be the first response in moments of suffering. Prayer then to confession. This is what we see in Job's life. He confesses, God, I'm so sorry. I was so wrong about you. I, I, I'm sure there's other things that I need to grow in. And so confessing those things and then Repentance which is to change your mind about those things through the power of the Spirit that God can change your mind about who He is and who you are in this world. And this leads to the true self. Wouldn't it be great to know that everybody in the room was just being their true selves? Right? And I'm not talking about you do you. That's a, that's a twisted version of the true self in our society. You do you is just fulfill every impulse, even if your impulses are sinful and not who God says you are. That's not, that's not your true self. Your true self is living in the identity that Christ has given you. It leads to healing. Wouldn't it be great if you could just have every wound heal healed? What would, you, what would your life be like if there were no, no more wounds that you were living out of? God wants to do that for you. And it leads to authentic relationships. This is why I love ACF Church. I have, I have the deepest relationships I've ever had in my life here. And the reason I think they're deep is because I and, and my friends have been willing to be honest with one another. And, and can I just, I want to tell you this. I want to tell you that it's scary. It is scary, to be real. Uh, for me, in a pastoral position, I feel a pressure to sort of be like Pastor Brian. And, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll see people throughout the town, you know, that I don't even know. People will see me at Walmart. Hey, Pastor Brian, I've never met you. I'm sorry if I don't remember your name. I, I saw you for two seconds at church. But there, people, are, people are watching me, and so I can feel this impulse to try to hide in, the, in, in this self that is, managed instead of leading into the deeper life. But through honesty, we can be fully known. And the, the motivation of the deeper life is the love of God. You're not living by religion. You're living by love. And, and that love calls you deeper and deeper into a relationship with Him and with each other. You see, the deeper life is not a life without pain. If that's what you're asking for, that doesn't exist. But it's found in letting pain lead you into a deeper relationship with your heavenly Father. And when you do, you'll become more convinced than ever that even when life isn't good, God always is. Do you believe that today? So I want to challenge you with one thing. I believe in this room that you probably need to schedule a real talk with God. Some of you aren't ready for that. You're like, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. And you need to emotionally prepare yourself for this. But I believe that there's some people in the room today that need to schedule a real talk with God. You need to prepare yourself because you don't know what God's going to say. 
But what I promise you, you will get in a real talk with God is grace. I promise you that you, what you'll experience is grace. Sometimes it's hard truth, right? Sometimes it's hard words, but it's always motivated by a loving father, right? He loves you. He does. And even when you're looking in his eyes and you think, if you loved me, why would you do this? Know this, that everything that God allows or does is motivated by his love for you. And that restoration is always the promise. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Why? Why should we approach God's throne with confidence? So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So if you want grace today, if you want God to meet you, you got to pray. You got to be honest with him. You got to share the 2% with God today so that he can heal you. So I want to encourage you to do something here. We're going to get a little uncomfortable. But who in the room here today, if you're honest, would be willing to just raise your hand and say, honestly, Pastor Brian, life sort of hurts right now. Just raise your hand in the room. That's okay. Throughout the room, people are saying, yeah, if I'm honest, life kind of hurts right now. I'd like, I'd like an encounter with the grace of God. I'm going to ask you to do a second step. If you raise your hand, would you just stand up real quick in the room? Just have the courage to stand up. I know it's scary, but we want to pray for you. I'm just, we're not going to do anything weird. We just want to pray for you. And uh, here's what I want you to do. If you're a Christian in the room, I want you to stand up. And I want you to find one of these people and put, put your hand on their shoulder. I want you to just gather. Everybody can stand up in the room. Find one of these people. Make sure nobody's left out. Um, if you're online with us, let us know how we can be praying for you as well. Um, yeah, we're... We just want to make sure that we're praying for one another, lifting each other up in this moment. And would you just bow your heads? I want to, I want to pray just for healing in this space. Father, you are a God that not, did not sit at a distance. You're a God that sent your son to us, Jesus. Your word says that you are not unfamiliar with pain. That you're familiar with suffering and you chose to come to the earth for us. And you know what it feels like to be rejected. You know what it feels like to be abandoned. You know what it feels like to be falsely accused, things that aren't true. You know what it feels like to, to feel alone. You know all of these things and you went through these things so that we might be healed. So Holy Spirit, I pray that in this room today that you do the miraculous work of healing in people's lives. God, we're so sick of the managed life. We're so sick of the, face, the fake self and the false self that we live in. God, we're sick of superficial relationships. We want to be motivated and, and experience the love of God in a deeper way today. God, could we all in this room believe in a more profound way today that you are good in every single way. God, I pray you'd heal today wounds from parents, words that were said that are still stuck in people's minds. I pray you'd heal wounds from broken marriages in this room where it just went terribly wrong and that bitterness is still eating people up on the inside. God, would you heal wounds from coworkers and and friends that should have been there and they just weren't? God, in this room, would you heal, heal wounds from the church today where we as Christians have failed people? We failed to look like Jesus in the face of suffering for people. God, would you, would you heal wounds from that today? And God, in that moment of suffering, whether it be recent or a long time ago, God, would you show us that you were there? And that you were loving us? And that as we wept, God, you wept. Father, thank you that you're a God of healing. Would you completely restore us today? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you find your seats, you can continue to stand. We're just going to sing and we're going to worship together in the next few moments. We have a space in the front of the room. We've just felt like God's leading us to, to make some room. And so there'll be some people at the front of the room here. If you need prayer, they'd love to pray for you. 
Uh, if you just need to kneel down before God and say, God, I stopped praying a long time ago, and you just need to lay that out. If you need to share the 2% in church today, don't go home without doing it. I want to encourage you to do that. So you can just get on your knees, just at the front of the stage. You can stand in worship. But I just want you to know this whole space is yours. Just get comfortable, move around, whatever you need to do. But just get in the presence of God and share the 2% as we worship. Love you guys.
seats. Um, hey, and just to encourage all of us uh, in here in the room as well, that whether you um, stood up uh, just at the end of the service or, or not, uh, just to encourage all of us that don't let anything keep you from having that conversation with God. Right, don't let anything talk you out of having that conversation. That if God started something um, in you this morning, um, don't let a to-do list today or work tomorrow or, or anything like that get in the way of you actually having that because God finishes what he starts. And so uh, just to encourage all of us with that. And then this morning as we continue in worship, we're going to continue to worship through um, giving. And uh, this past week, uh, the staff was able to kind of get away for a retreat and, and pray about the future and, and see what it was that God is calling ACF to and what that would look like. And there's some really exciting and, and awesome things coming up in, in the future of ACF. But part of that for, for us of looking ahead and, and praying about where God was taking us is also looking back and seeing what God has already done and how he's been faithful even this far even at ACF uh, with, with all of that. And so the cool thing about, uh, about some of this, of, of hearing stories of life change and being reminded of all the baptisms that happen here and, and the outreach events and, and the different groups that meet and all of these things is that for every single story like that that's happened here, there's been an army of generous people behind it. But there's, there's been so many of you giving faithfully and giving towards events or giving uh, just towards the church and, and allowing this to be a place where people can have their lives changed by encountering Jesus. And so when we give, we get to give to that, that you're not giving to ACF, you're giving through ACF to see these stories of life change happen. And so behind me on the screen, there's gonna be uh, the different ways that you can give this morning, whether that's online or on our app, or if you brought um, a cash or, a cash or a check with you um, here today, there's black boxes on the walls as you exit that you can turn those in. Uh, but this is a, a great way just to be able to partner uh, in that. And then you, you, if you have given, have been a part of life change in somebody's life here at ACF. Right, and then speaking of some of these outreach events and some of the things we get to see God do through this, we have a huge outreach event coming up at the end of this month here, just in a couple of weeks. So if you would, just turn your attention to the screen and let's see what's coming up here at ACF. Yeah, Trunk or Treat is coming up here in a couple of weeks, and as you can tell from some of the awesome and questionable things from that video, that this is a, a great way for us to get to serve our community, love our community, but then also show that the church can throw the best parties, all right? And so this is going to be the first Trunk or Treat I've been a part of here at ACF, and I'm super excited. I hope that you are excited as well, and there's a lot of ways that you can get involved in that, whether that's bringing your kids and your own family to be a part of it and inviting friends and neighbors to, to come along with you, or if that's hosting a, a, a trunk and just of your, uh, your own or serving at this event in another capacity. There's so many ways you can get involved with this and make sure that this is a great event for our community. And so there's a card in your seat with a QR code on it. So if you scan that code, you can sign up today to be a part of that and serving and, and seeing uh, this, this party happen in our community and get to love on our community well through that. So we'd love to see you there on October 29th here at ACF. And so I'd love to pray for you as we wrap up our service and head into our week. So if you would just stand where you're at as we pray to close out our service this morning. And so God, we thank you for who you are. God, we, we thank you that you are good even when we maybe don't understand or don't have all of the answers. God, we thank you that we can trust that you are good just because of who you are. And so God, we pray this week that any areas of, of pain or grief or struggle in our lives, Jesus, that, that you would just remind us that we can trust you. God, that you are there with us, that you are in the midst of whatever that is with us. And God, that you are good to see that through in our lives. And so God, we trust you with that today. God, we thank you for who you are in the midst of that. And we pray that you would have all the glory and the worship from everything that happens in our lives. So God, we love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ACF. Y'all have a great week.